Welcome back, everybody. This week is International Week of the Deaf. It's a time to celebrate the deaf community, and it's also a great opportunity to discuss how we can achieve greater inclusion and accessibility. Joining us today to push that conversation forward is educator and researcher Janelle Rouse and American Sign Language interpreter Marcia Adolf. Welcome to the show. Now, Janelle, we're speaking with you for the oh. first time in this pandemic. And while this has certainly been a challenging time for everyone, what adjustments have you personally had to make in order to navigate this pandemic as a deaf person? <sighs> okay. Well, before mm -hmm. COVID, pre-COVID, it was fairly easy to navigate and to communicate with people who didn't know ASL. I could kind of figure out what people were trying to say because by eye contact, body movement, that kind of thing. And so it's been previously fairly easy. I asked people to write back and forth, maybe type on their phone. But now during COVID, we're kind of in a situation where, you know, with people, it's, it's become harder. It's become harder. People are wearing masks. Um, uh, people want to socially distance, so writing back and forth or typing on your cell phone. People don't want to physically get too close to you. So when people want to speak to me and then you have that eye contact, they don't know if they should speak, walk away. They're not sure what to do and people are confused. So it has been tough, I have mm -hmm. to say. But at the same time, uh, it has been difficult, but I'm starting to realize, I'm starting to notice that people are taken with ASL, with American Sign Language, because it's a way for them to com communicate. They're interested in learning sign and you can communicate from a distance. So yeah, I'm starting to notice that. Interpreters have been, you know, clearly very present in the press briefings that we've seen throughout the pandemic, but the deaf community had to fight for this representation. Was there a resistance to including interpreters in these ways? Yeah. Um, from what I've heard through the grapevine, that has been an issue. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was resistance, absolutely. Uh, people didn't really understand the seriousness of having access to information. It's a matter of life and death to have access to these uh, health updates and emergency updates. So the deaf community were meeting that resistance. There was one local community that actually had to make a human rights claim and sue to make sure that that would be, uh, that ASL interpretation would be included. And yeah, it has been an issue, absolutely. Mm. You know, still following that line of questioning, we've seen in this pandemic uh, that a lack of accessible information, exactly as you said, Janelle, can be a matter of life and death. Now, given the inaccessibility of public health messaging, this number astounded me. It has been found that members of the deaf community are 6.9 times more likely than non-deaf individuals to have inadequate health literacy. When you hear that number, does that surprise you at all? It doesn't surprise me. No, it doesn't. That kind of access to information, it should be accessible to the broader public. And when I think about medical information, it's, there's not, I'm looking at medical professionals uh, don't necessarily have the tools to communicate. And it's a basic human rights issue and oftentimes forgotten. So that misunderstanding, that lack of access, for example, interpreter services should have been immediately put into place. If you recognize that you're working with a deaf client, a deaf patient, someone asks for an interpreter, make sure an interpreter is put into place. Oftentimes they'll be resistant or try and get a family member or a relative to interpret that information. And it's not the detailed information that's clearly communicated to those deaf patients or consumers. And having a, a, a relative come in and not use those appropriate terms about medical information, 
there's that lack of patience or people try to hurry through getting that information out because they don't have the patience. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous. Yeah. The approach that one would prefer for deaf individuals, oftentimes ASL, American Sign Language, or Sign Language is the first primary language for communication. People, I think, oftentimes, if they've met one deaf individual, they try and do some kind of cookie cutter approach and think that that one person mm. represents all of the differences and nuances within the deaf community, and they absolutely don't. So there's absolutely a lack of information in general about the deaf community and the nuances about difference within the deaf community. Wow, this is such great information. Listen, uh, Canada recognizes American Sign Language. Quebec Sign Language and Indigenous Sign Language as primary languages for deaf persons. Now, you, Janelle, are currently researching the place of Black American Sign Language here in Canada, which is itself a dialect of American Sign Language. So on a personal level, why is that work so important and urgent for you? Yes. Before I kind of, I, I guess, give my answer, I want to take a little bit of time to explain a little bit about Black ASL. Um, black ASL, American, Black American Sign Language, I'm doing some research. We have a team. Um, black American Sign Language um, is, has been documented down in the United States. I would recommend that you read a book um, I would recommend a book, uh, if I can just get that name for you. The Hidden Treasure of Black ASL, written by Carolyn McCaskill, Dr. Carolyn McCaskill, Seal Lucas, Robert Bailey, and Joseph Hill, The Hidden Treasure of Black ASL. And that speaks to the history of Black ASL and linguistics and culture and all of that in the U.S. Um, <laughs> what happened in the U.S. is there was segregation laws, and what ended up happening was Black ASL was developed in a segregated sy system by Black students, and they have their own language that was divided by history. And so, speaking to my own personal <laughs> journey, um, we're doing some research in his into the history of Black ASL here in Canada because it hasn't been documented. <laughs> so, as Black as Canadians, we don't really know the history. It hasn't been passed down here in Canada in the same way as in the United States. We've limited in the information that we have. And so we're hoping to start out in the Maritimes. Um, it's had an impact. And so I think we need to take some time and do the research. Last year, I um, gra graduated from the Applied Linguistics Program at Western University with my doctorate. And I'm interested to continue research. And so we have a small team of researchers that are working with me. And we're starting to develop that research. We're looking at specific topics around Black ASL, and we're going to find out what's the presence here in Canada. Does it exist? And so next summer, uh, 2022, the hope is that we're going to do that research, start with that research. What, what important and fascinating work. To make our own interactions and environments more accessible, you say one of the most important things we can do as individuals is to seek out authentic sources on the deaf community. What do you mean by that? Yes, yes, absolutely. So when we talk about authentic, specifically, I think it's very important to make sure that if you're interested in learning about sign language, I, I say approach, for example, people think, you know what, approach someone like Marcia, because we speak the same language, Marcia's hearing, you're hearing, and you want to speak to Marcia because you share the same language. I would say don't do that. The most authentic mm. uh, way to get the message about sign and about culture and what it looks like is to immerse yourself by meeting with someone who grew up within the deaf community and is fully immersed in the deaf community and learn from, from that person. So there may be an ASL instructor who is deaf. Um, there may be an ASL tutor, or if you're lucky, you happen to meet someone who's deaf and uses uh, sign language to communicate and you develop a relationship and perhaps you're interested in taking courses. Take those courses that are taught by deaf people 
those are people who are culturally competent, are fully immersed in the language, and grow up with the language. And so I think, in general, what one needs to think about, for example, parents. Parents who have a child who, are, who is deaf, and they're wondering what they can do. Perhaps they have a newborn, they have a baby, and they're thinking, would sign language be beneficial? And so who do they speak to? They speak to their otolaryngologist, their ear, nose, and throat doctor, or their audiologist. Those people have a specialty in looking at the mechanics around hearing or how hearing works, not about language or linguistics. So you should speak to someone or interact with someone who grew up deaf and use sign to communicate, someone, an adult who's deaf, and talk about the benefits of language. So if you speak to that person, that's where you get the authenticity. Making the assumption that a medical professional knows everything culturally and linguistically, yeah. they have their specific areas of knowledge and research and expertise around medical interventions when it comes to hearing loss, but when you're looking for authenticity, you should go to the deaf community. Wow, this has just been such uh, an eye-opening discussion. Uh, to Janelle and Marcia, thank you both for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and perspectives. Yeah, it's been uh, a real eye-opener. I very much appreciate you having me here today. Thank you. And we'll be right back after this.